Hi everyone. In this video, I'll show you how to work with interactive graphs, tables, and widgets within Google Colab. We'll focus on three packages in order to do this, which include IPy widgets, which is already installed within Google Colab, and we'll also work with two third-party packages, which include Evidently and Facets. The first thing that we'll do is we need to install Evidently and Facets, as well as Y Finance, which is Yahoo Finance, in order for us to work with some of these interactive tables and graphs. And we'll also have to restart our runtime, which is what this OS kill function does. So let's run that now. When you run this, it may take a minute to run. I'll just clear the output here and we'll move on. The next thing that we need to do is if we are using widgets that are third party widgets within Google Colab, we need to use this output dot enable custom widget manager in it in order to be able to run some of those widgets. And we're also going to import all the packages we're using. So let's do that now. Let's start first at looking with widgets in IPython environments. And we'll start off with looking at IPy widgets. And let's say that we have a function 2x plus 4 and we want to get the output y. We can use a widget slider in order to illustrate how this function works. And what widgets are, are eventful Python objects that have a representation in the browser often as a controller like a slider or text box. In our case, we'll be looking at sliders for all of these examples. The first thing that we'll do is we'll code out this function and I'll just call it func. And it takes one input, which is x. And we're just going to return the y, which is two multiplied by x plus four. And the way that we can get this as a widget is we're from IPy widgets, we're going to call interact. And from interact, we need to pass in two parameters, the function, which we just coded out, and then the X value, which I will set at 10. Let's run this. And also put out a semicolon just to get rid of that text. And we have our function as a slider right now. And we can see that we can adjust the slider right now, it's set at 10. So we have two multiplied by 10 plus four, and that gets 24. If we bring this down to zero, we have the Y equaling four, and we can continue to adjust it for different values. When it's 30, the Y output is 64. You can change the X value and what we can also do is we can get multiple sliders here in case we have a multivariate function, meaning multiple variables. That's what we'll do now. I'll call this multivariate func. And it's similar to our previous function where we have two multiplied by X and we add by four, but we also have a Y variable, which we also multiply by two and we'll get a output of Z in this case. And we have two parameters that we need to input into our function in order to get our output. And like before, we'll call interact from IPy widgets, and we'll pass in our multivariate function as the first argument. And then we also need to put in the X values, which I'll set at 10 again, and Y, which I'll also set at 10 and run this. Great, and we can see here that now we have two sliders, one for X, one for Y. And we can see that if we have a X of 10, 2 times 10 is 20, and of y of 10, 2 times 10 is also 20. Then, and we add some all those together, we have 44. And we can play around with the values and see how that affects the value of our z function. 
And this can be a simple de demonstration. Maybe you have a more complex function, or this can also be a learning tool in case you want to teach somebody for math for the first time. This simple tool and slider can be a helpful tool to use. Let's move on to interactive graphs. We'll also use IPy widgets for this. And the first thing I'll do is I'll, I'm using a template from the IPy widgets documentation with a few edits of myself. And I'm going to create a function called linear func. And it is going to take two inputs, slope and intercept. So we'll have a slope of a line and the intercept of a line. And we'll be able to change those dynamically with sliders. Next thing I need to do is I need to put in plt.figure because we're going to graph out this function. I also need to put in the x values. And I'll put in the y limits and x limit and just the y limits of this graph. So we have an upper bound and a lower bound for our graph. And then I'll do a few other things. I'll just have a black bar run through our x-axis and y-axis at zero. And I'll color the graph red and we'll get to see what this looks like. We have our function for our linear func defined. Now we also need to create a interactive plot variable. And we're going to call interactive again. And we're going to take in the linear function. We're going to give slope. And what we're going to do here is we're going to put in the values that we can change on the slider. And I'm just going to make this range from five to five point, negative 5 5.0 to uh, 5.0 positive. And the reason that I'm putting this as a float is if we put this as an integer, IPy widgets will increment it by one, but if we input this as a floating point number, meaning a fraction, then we can implement it by fractions when we change it on the slider. Same thing for the intercept is it's going to, I'll make it range from negative 5.0 to 5.0. Then I'm going to have the output and I'm going to give it interactive plot dot children function and we're going to return the negative one index and let's call the interactive plot. Great. Right now we have our slope at zero and intercept at zero. And that just means our lot line is going to go from negative 10 on the x-axis to 10, but it, ha it does not go above 0 on the y-axis. Let's change the slope a bit. And we can see that as we slide up, the slope increases. And we can go the other way, where our slope is now negative. And as we increment x, the y output is going to be more and more negative. Let's go back to a positive slope. When we increment by x, the y output increases on the y axis positively. We can also change the intercept, which is the point at which the our line here crosses the y axis. We can go negative first and we'll see a dip. And we can also go the other way, make it positive. And we can all, right here, we have a linear function graphed out. We can also graph out a nonlinear function. And I'm just going to copy and paste. And we have the same, the, the function is similar to the previous one, except instead of just multiplying by the slope, and adding by the intercept, we're also going to put in an x, we're going to square the x as well. And we'll take a look at that. 
And we can play around with this graph as well. And we can see that it's nonlinear here. And we can see what happens as we change the slope. And as we change the intercept as well. And these can be pretty cool visualization tools if you want to just get a idea of what a function looks like and what a function might look like if you change some of the variables when you plot it out. Moving on, we'll take a look at interactive data frames. And in this case, Colab actually has this extension built in where we can render a pandas data frame into interactive displays that can be filtered, sorted, and explored. And they use this, this package called data table display in order to do this. Let's take a look. What I'll do is I'm going to create a data frame and I'm going to call the YF function, which is Yahoo Finance, and I'm going to download some stock data. Now we have it downloaded and let's take a look at the data frame. And this is pretty cool. I believe that this is something that Google Colab put in recently, but if we take a look at our data frame, we can see that in the top right corner, we have this wand. And this wand is what enables us to convert this data frame into an interactive table for us to look and sort the data as we see fit. Let's click on this. And now we see that we have this changed where we have the data and we can sort it. If I go up to date, I can sort by ascending or descending order. I can sort it by volume to see which days Apple was traded the most. I can adjust the uh, or filter on the adjusted close to see when Apple hit its highest point during this period of time and when it hit its lowest point. And I can also use this filter button here. If I click on that, I can filter by the adjusted close if I want to see the price ranges for a certain range, and if I want to see a certain volume. I can also sort by date. Let's say that I want to just get the values for January, and I just type in 2021-01, and this filters out just the values for January of 2021. And this is pretty cool. And the coolest part is that we don't have to import a module in order to do this. And we don't have to install anything in our Google Colab environment to do this. When we have the pandas data frame, we could just click in the top right corner on the wand and we'll be able to filter, sort, and play with the data using this extension. Moving on. We're going to move on to third party packages that allow us to visualize data. And what I am going to highlight first is Facets. And Facets is a program that was created and it allows us to visualize features. And there's two different packages that Facets really uses. Facets Dive, which will allow us to play around with the features visually and facets overview, which will give us more descriptive statistics of the features. Let's get started. What we'll do first is we're going to clone this repository from GitHub using this git command, and we're going to move it from the folder into our content using this bash scripting. So let's run this now. We can see here that we have the generic statist feature statistics, we'll need to import this because this is a pi file. And the way that we do this is we'll just call import generic feature statistics generator. And now we can use this within our Google Colab environment. So what I'll do now is I am going to drag and drop some data, and this is going to be from Kaggle. I'll include, the link is below at the very end of the notebook, but I'll also include this in the GitHub folder. 
And now I have this in our content folder. And this is going to be attrition data that IBM collected, meaning people that left their jobs for another opportunity. And I'll call this HR data. And I'm going to use a pandas data frame to read this in. And let's take a look at the data. And here we have various data. We have the age of the employee. We have whether or not that they left, which is what attrition means, that they quit their jobs. Whether or not they flew frequently, daily rate of payment, the department that they worked on, and a few other features here. And we'll see that when we plug this in, we'll be able to dive into this and visualize some of this with facets. Let's do that now. And what I'm going to do is, before I do that, I'm going to actually create training data and testing data. And what I'm, go I'm going to, just in case that this is ordered in some way, I'm going to resample this to mix it up so we can split this up into training and testing data. I'll call HR data and I'll set that equal to HR data. And then we can use the sample function and we set the fraction equal to one, meaning this will just jumble up the data randomly so we can split it up into the training and testing data. And we can take a look at that to confirm that we were actually able to mix this data up a bit. And we can see by just looking at the first couple of rows, they are different and also the indices. Great. The next thing that we need to do is we need to split this into training and testing data. And I'll roughly split one third of this into the testing data and the other third into the, the, fir the first one third into testing data, then the last two thirds into training data. And we have that split up. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this, the notebook that we, or the pi file that we imported, and we have a function in there that we're going to use, which is the generic feature statistics generator. And I'm going to run that. Next, I'm going to use this in order to create this proto variable, variable for pro, standing for protocol. And we're going to create this into our training data and our testing data. Then we have this proto store, which is going to serialize this into strings. And we also have to decode this from UTF-8. Finally, we have this, and this I directly copied and pasted from the facet GitHub. And this is actually going to return us the visual of the features and we have some HTML here, and we're going to return the HTML and it's going to be interactive where we can play with the data. So let's run this at this point. And the cool thing here is we have all this broken up. I'm going to zoom out a bit. And we can look at the data from various different ways. Right now we have it labeled by job role if I zoom in, we can see that we have the various jobs that these people held, which is sales executive, research director, and we have it labeled by colors for the number of companies that the, the employees work for. So if they're purple, they worked for two companies. And we can take a look at this further. We can break this into, let's take a look total working years. And we can see that we have a wide range and we have lighter colors for the people that work zero to eight years. And it increasingly gets darker and bluer as the number of years continue to work. So we have a range here displaying the working years. And we can take a look at a different in this case, we're looking if the people 
quit their current job or if they are stayed. And we can see the majority of people stayed in their current jobs while the which is labeled by the blue spheres and the red circles show people that have quit their jobs and the position they held. And we can change this as well. We can take a look at hourly rates and we can see the hourly rates. We can also add data on the Y and X axis by taking a look at education. And this is the number of years of education or I believe this might be the number of, of the level of education. And we can take a look at education field. And this is what they focused on within university. Then we can add this on the X axis as well. And this allows us to further dig into data to see if there are any patterns or hierarchical structures that we can identify visually. And right now we're looking at the training data set and we can also take a look at this on the testing data set to see if how well our training and testing match each other if we were able to split it relatively well or if we if there's not overlap that might be an issue with our training and testing data set. And moving on, we can also take a look at the facets overview, which will give us more of a test, the descriptive statistics of the data. And again, we have this HTML template that was written by the people over at working at facets straight from the GitHub. And we can just hit shift enter to run this. and just had to rerun that. And now we have the descriptive statistics for this, and we have a breakdown of the numeric features of the variables. And if I slide down here, we have the categorical features as well, meaning the non-numerical ones or the binary features, such as the department that they work in, whether or not they quit their jobs or not, and the number of people that did that. And we can see that we have these orange bars and these blue bars on our histogram. And that just shows that we have the testing data and training data. And the from this here, we can see that the orange is the testing while the blue is the training, just to see how much overlap there is. And if there's a wide difference between the two that might cause issues if we're modeling the data and we're looking to explain the data using the features and they don't line up the what the the facet overview also does is that it will highlight if there are a lot of zeros and we can see that over a certain threshold it will be red so there's a lot of people that have zero numbers of companies that they work for. So that might be their first job or they're looking for a job. And we have stock option levels, which isn't surprising because most people don't have stock options. So there will be a lot of zero values there and for some of the other features as well. And this is a cool tool to use for exploratory data analysis when you're just getting to know it within Google Colab. You do have to, since this is a third party package, you need to, you can't just import this and run this. You'll have to allow third party widgets within Google Colab and then get this from, get this notebook from GitHub and then download it in order to get this analysis. But I, I think it might be worth it if you're new to exploratory data analysis and it takes a lot of work it does a lot of work right off the bat for you the final package widget package i'll highlight is evidently and evidently helps evaluate machine learning models during the validation and monitor them in production the tool generates interactive visual reports and json profiles from pandas data frames or csv files and let's take a look at that now 
what I'll do is I have a, another Excel file and I'll include this in the GitHub. And this is from Fred, which is the St. Louis Feds database. And we'll take a look at some of the economics data. So I'm going to read this into a data frame, I'm going to rename one of the columns into our target column, which we need to do for the evidently package. And we'll take a brief look at this. And what we're interested in is the consumer price index, or this is a me measure of the inflation that for prices that consumers might experience. And we have two variables that, two features that we are looking to explain this. We have the 10 year real interest rate, which is the interest, the adjusted interest rate that is currently in the market. And then we also have total non-farm payrolls, which is an estimate of the current workforce in specific fields. So what we'll do is we'll load in the, we have evidently loaded in, and we're going to run this through one of the evidently reports. And the report I'll highlight is the data drift report. And I'm just going to copy and paste this here and run this real quick. And what this did here, we called the evidently dashboard for the data drift, and then it calculates it for the data set that we have. What we're going to do is we want to take a look if there's data drift, which is, does the data vary over time that we're looking at? And we need to put in the reference data and the current data. And we have the reference data first and then the current data second. So if you have, if you're continually updating your data, you'll have the reference data as the previous data set. And then your current data set is the one that you just collected. And if there is variance over time, then this could cause issues with the models and you might have to update your model in order to account for that variance. Let's take a look at this now. And we have the report illustrated here. And what this has is the reference distribution, which is our previous data. And this really is the data from 2000 and before that. And our current distribution, which is the current data set that we're looking at, is the data from 2000 forward up to 2021 right now. And what this does is it takes a look at the distribution of both the past data and the current data that we're working with. If there's a significant difference between the two, then there might be data drift, which is what this package is detecting. And this is a pretty cool feature. As you get more into modeling and statistics and machine learning, this becomes more and more important as most data in real life is time varying. And there are also other packages with it and classes and functions within evidently that are used to test how well the regression does and goes into exploratory data analysis as well. And you can check that out on their GitHub page. Thank you for watching. I hope that this was helpful. And I just highlighted some of the packages and widgets that I thought were interesting. But if you want to check out a larger set of widgets, you can go here to this GitHub page. I will warn you that not all of these will work with Google Colab and you'll have to try them out to see if they do. I had some trouble trying to work with IPy volume as well as other packages here. So be wary of that. And you might have to use just a local Jupyter notebook in order to do that. And these are just the various websites for if you want to go further into the packages I highlighted, such as facets or evidently, and then just the documentation for IPy widgets and a video explanation that goes into what Drapid data drift is by evidently itself. If you found this video useful, feel free to like it, subscribe, and you can also connect with me on LinkedIn, Twitter, and GitHub. Thanks everyone for watching and happy coding.